Okay. Think if I was going to choose for us to understand one thing out of the book of John, what I'm going to be talking about this morning is that. And that is, what does real Christian faith look like? What does it look like in everyday life? What is it, what is it, how does it manifest itself? How do we recognize it? And how do we recognize that which is what I would call a fake faith? There's a lot of talk these days about fake news. But a fake faith is probably one of the most dangerous things that a Christian can, can be exposed to and embrace is something that's not real. We've had a lot of conversation around the church and around this community the last several months about the, the importance of absolute truth. Did you know that of evangelical Christians, only one in three who profess to be an evangelical Christian, only one in three believe in absolute truth, that there is an absolute truth. And then when the Bible speaks something that is true, it is absolutely true. That is not, it is not something that, that, well, maybe it's true, or maybe it's true for you, but it's not true for me. No, if the Bible addresses it, it is true. And we can, we can embrace that. But there is also a lot of stuff going on today that, that falls into the category of what I call faith with a small f. What is faith with a small f? Faith with a small f is, is faith in me. Well, I've just, got, I've just got faith in me that I'll get this job. I've just got faith in the event that I'm going to is going to be moving to me. I've got faith in this other person that they're going to be good to my family. I've got faith in, no, what is, what, when we speak of Christian faith, what is Christian faith? What is it? It is this faith in the person and work of Jesus Christ. The person and work of Jesus Christ. When I put my faith in me, or I put my faith in you, or I put my faith in, in this building, or I put my faith in anything else other than the person and work of Jesus Christ, then I'm putting my faith in something that has no no worthiness of my faith. Can, can we get that? So when we're talking about faith or faith, we're talking about having a faith in the appropriate person and work and not in an event. People say, well, pastor, when you go to the hospital with someone, do you pray for their healing? Sure I do. But do I have faith in their healing? Or do I have faith in the person whose healing is in their hands? And do I trust whatever decision Christ makes in that event to be not only okay, but the very best it can be? Boy, it got quiet all of a sudden. Do, do you understand what I'm saying? This, the, the events that surround what we call faith ministries today are, are not only dis, disruptive, to many people in terms of their genuine walk with the Lord, but what we find is they actually become in conflict with what God may be doing in their life. And when we, when we come to trust in something, we had, we had a good friend years ago in North Carolina, and she followed this one faith healer around all over the country. She came out here to Los Angeles. She went to Indianapolis, Indiana. She, anywhere he was, she would fly there because she was convinced that he was going to heal her. Now listen, I'm going I'm to be talking about some stuff this morning that may make you a little nervous. And, that, and it's okay. Uh, in fact, I'm going to show a, a video clip that I've never shown this video clip that somebody didn't get mad at me. But, it's, but that's okay too. Because I want you to know that not only truth exists, but I want you to know what it is. This faith that we have, if it's not placed in Jesus Christ, and what that means is this that I am trusting Him with the outcome, listen, no matter what it is that I want the outcome to be. That I'm going to, my prayer is going to be this, that my prayer is going to be, Lord, here's what, I, here's what I'd really like to have happen. Here's the healing I'd like for my body. Here's the healing I'd like for my spirit. Here's the healing I'd like for, for, my, for my temperament, whatever it, that is. 
but then to trust him with whatever it is. Now, there are things biblically that we know we can pray for, and he says, if you'll pray for this, I'll give it to you. Wisdom is one of those things. If we'll pray for wisdom, God promises he will give us that. But there are things that we pray for that we ought to be saying, God, just show me what your will is, because here's, here's the, the eventuality of my prayer. I want my prayer to be God to reveal to me what he wants out of me in my life and what he desires for me. That should be the end result. It's not for me to tell God, God, here's what I want. Here's what, here's what you need to deliver to me because if you do this, then, then I'll tell the world you gave it to me. That's a dangerous place to be. And that is not faith, by the way. That's a fraud that's perpetrated upon genuine Christian faith. And we need to be careful about what it is we say that we believe concerning this idea of faith. So is it faith or faith? Are we following saints or, or shysters? There's a lot of shysters out there using the name of Jesus to appropriate money or fame or fortune or both. There's a lot of it going around. And I'll show you one of those clips this morning and tell you why that we need to be careful of this stuff. Because if we point people in the direction <clears throat> of a false faith and they attribute that to God, and then God doesn't deliver what they said they wanted, and they become disappointed in God, then their faith is going to be a hurt and not grown. Because they were seeking the wrong thing. We need to be seeking what it is God wants for us. What He desires for us. What is the nature of true, genuine faith? We're going to be looking at this historical event this morning of a nobleman that comes to Jesus... And he comes to him and he says, my son is at the verge of death. My son is at the verge of death. And I want you to come where he is, which was about 25 miles from where they were at this point. Come to where he is so that you might heal him. I've heard that you heal people. I've heard that you can raise people from the dead and heal the blind and heal the lame and, and, and heal the leper. Come to my son and heal him. And Jesus says to him, go, go back home, your son's healed. Now there's a series of events that happens here that points to what genuine faith looks like. And I'm going to give it to you before we get there this morning because I want you to notice it full bore when we get there. I want you to see, yep, this is the event that Pastor was talking about. So here's, here's the series of events. The man comes to him comes to Jesus, and he says, my son, my son is, is in need. My son's dying. I need for him to be healed. And Jesus tells him, says, go, your son is healed. The man immediately turns to go home. It's called a step of faith. Count that step one. He came, he believed enough to take a step of faith. He takes the step of faith. What, what happened there? Jesus spoke a word. Jesus spoke a word, and on Jesus' word, the man takes a step of faith to go back home. Now, here's what I will say, and we'll see this by the end of the story this morning. The man does not have what you would call a full-blown faith at this point, but he trusts Jesus enough to turn and head back home as Jesus told him to go. Why do I know that? Because if he didn't believe, here's what I'd have been doing if I didn't believe, but please, Jesus, come, just come. Just come to where my child is. Just come and, and heal my child. Please, please don't deny me this. Just don't dismiss me. Don't tell me to go home. Don't ask me to trust you in this. Just come. I know you can heal him. He would have begged, but no, he turns and takes a step of faith. So he has a belief enough to take a step of faith, and then that step of faith is taken, and when he gets home, his servants are rushing to him, and the servants tell him, your son's been healed. Come and rejoice, your son's been healed. And, the, and the, this nobleman turns to the servants, and he says to them, at what hour was he healed? And he said he was healed in the seventh hour, and it says, then the nobleman believed. 
The word, the word for belief there in the, in the New Testament is the exact same word for faith. The nobleman believed. Belief enough to take a step of faith, the step of faith to do exactly what the Word says, exactly what it says, and then go and be confirmed in the Word that you learned that you took the step of faith toward. This is the nature of faith. Now, I want you to understand, it's a simple process. But the events surrounding real life and in, in appropriating faith is, are often not that simple. But if we will remember, here is the nature of faith. Listen to me again. You come, you believe enough to take a step of faith, and you walk out of a step of faith based on the Word of God. Jesus spoke a word. He he acts on that word and he goes back and he has confirmed in his life then that that what he did in taking that step of faith was worthy. It It was of God. Now I've seen this over and over again in my life. I know when Jesus is moving, when God is moving and he is directing me to a place or a person or an event that sometimes I look at it and I go, I just, I don't, when we got ready to go out to the prison to do the prison ministry, Carol came and said, this, this guy's wanting you to come out there and do this prison ministry. And I looked at my schedule and I went, I don't have time to do the prison ministry. You know, I'm, I'm up to here and I'm drowning. I'm looking for a, a breath of air, enough that I can breathe outside of the office. I need something besides another ministry to do. And when, when, when I knew it was right, the step of faith was to go and start that process. Now here's what happened. Now I'm I'm just I'm about to give you a testimony, so listen to what I'm about to say. Here's what happened. I found now that when I go to do this prison work where I was to be ministering to them that I am revived and I have breath, I have air, I have spirit, I have, I have a love, I have a joy, I have a compassion for people that are there that is reviving in my life. And there's something going on there, and I can see God beginning to work, and it's exciting, and I go there, and I almost never want to go on Saturday. I'll just be honest with you. I almost never want to go, and I go. Just faithfully go, and I show up, and these guys, I can breathe. There's a revival taking place in me. That God gave me what I needed by my answering the faith step of faith to go and do what He said do. Does, does any of this make sense? Y'all are looking at me like... This is, this is the nature of faith. So here, get, I want you to see this. Again, let me, let me just be sure everybody's got what I've got so far. This is a faith in the person and work of Jesus Christ. It is a faith that His Word, His Word is true, and when His Word says do something, it doesn't matter if it's convenient for me or not. It doesn't matter if it's comfortable for me or not. It doesn't matter if I, can, if I think I can afford it or not. It doesn't matter if it's going to be nice or not. By human explanation. It doesn't matter. If His Word says it, then my responsibility in faith is to take that step of faith. And then have go and watch what God does to confirm that what He has told me is where I need to be going. Now here's what happens sometimes. Let me just tell you this before we get into this this morning. Here's what happens sometimes. Sometimes I, I'm misdirected by my own passions. None of you have ever been there. My own passions. And I, so I, I get all excited about something and I say, oh yeah, I'm, I'm, I can do that. I'm, I'm excited about that. And, and I fail to, to see if God is really speaking to me about something because I don't spend time, enough time in prayer with Him. I don't spend enough time in His Word. I don't spend enough time looking and listening. And so I just jump into something and then God confirms I don't need to be there. You, no, nobody's ever had that experience but me. See, that, that, that happens as well. 
But what I've learned from that is I've learned more and more and more how to recognize when God is speaking to me through his word, through other people that, that, that come into my life, that speak into my life, the truth of God's word. Now, I'm not talking about just speaking to be speaking. I'm talking about speaking God's word into my life to where I can understand this is something God would have me do. It's a matter of his word and con- being confirmed in what we see him doing after we get there. Sometimes I've had to go, okay, when I get in those situations, I have to do an about face and say, okay, God, now what would you, were you really telling me? And see, that's the hard thing because it's a matter of pride. Okay, so let, let's just look at this nature of faith. Faith versus faith. John chapter 4 will begin in verse number 46. So if you've got your Bibles, turn there. I'll also have the text on the screen this morning. He came, therefore, again to Cana of Galilee. Now you'll remember, if you've been with us through this process, that this Cana is where Jesus did his first miracle. That's where we started in John. Uh, so he, he comes to Cana. There's a wedding there. He, he turns water into wine. You remember that whole series of events and what the water was in and what it was sim- symbolic of, all of that. So he's coming back to Cana now. And he says where he had made the water into wine. And there was a certain royal official uh, whose son was sick at Capernaum. Now let's just look at this. It's a distance of about 42 kilometers or, or 25 miles. Here's, here's Capernaum. Here's Cana. So he's, he's, he's here, and, and the guy's wanting him to come back over here. Or vice versa, rather. Uh, so, so it's a distance of about 25 miles. In those days on foot, or on the back of a donkey or something, you're talking about a day, maybe two days traveling time to get back there. So here's the, that's sort of the, the setup here. When he heard that Jesus had come out of Judea into Galilee, he went to him. So the man had made this journey specifically to see Jesus, and he was requesting him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Now, some of us have been to the place that we we get that telephone call and we we have fear. You know, our child is about to die. I, I remember getting one of those telephone calls one September 1st. And my son-in-law says to me, now, don't panic. Now, when your son-in-law says don't panic, what do you do? <laughs> Automatically, we, it's time to panic. Don't panic. Carrie's okay. But she fell 25 feet head first into an, onto an asphalt surface in a parking garage. And she's pretty busted up, but she's okay. And all I could think of is 25 feet head first onto asphalt, how does anybody survive that? I, I, just, I couldn't fathom it. And she was broke up. I mean, she, both arms broke. We found parts of her wrist up in her shoulder. So she had fallen like this. you know. And she was broke up. She couldn't eat. She couldn't wipe her own little fanny. Elva went down and, and fed her and took care of her and bathed her and did everything we could for her for, for months. Busted up. If you've ever been to that place that you had that rush, you know what this man's going through. <coughs> He's going into, a, into a, a place of fear because his son is about to die. And his son being at the point of death, he says, I'm going to go to the one that I know can fix that. I'm going to go to Jesus. Now, did Jesus, let me ask you this, was Jesus required to heal the son? No. No. If he had not healed the son, there would have been reason for that. Maybe not one that we could see or understand, but but one that 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 is is purely good in God's in God's eyes. Now here's the thing that that I've had to come to. If that's the truth, am I willing to accept God's answer for me, even if it's not what I want? What, what, what am I going to do with God's answer? I, I don't know all the events that would be or wouldn't be. I don't know all of the events that would happen otherwise. But, but there's, there's, a, there's something God knows that we, we can be assured of. And here, here's the point that I want you to know. 
you can absolutely be sure of. When God does something in your life, if you're tuned into Him, praying to Him, and trusting Him, regardless of what the outcome is, it will always be ultimately for your good and for God's glory. Both of those things are going to be true. Now, we might not see that in the flesh. I, sometimes God does give me glimpses. I call them holy glimpses. I'll, he'll just show me a little piece of something, and I'll go, wow, is that how that fits together? And then I, I, what happens there? Well, the same thing that happened to this man when he got back home. He gets home, the, 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 the servants rush to him. He says, what hour was he healed? They said, the seventh hour. That's the hour Jesus spoke to me to go home. And he, and he has a reassurance that God has done what he said he would do, that his word was true and his his action of taking an action. You see, faith is an action word. The word, a step of faith, trusting, and having confirmed that what has taken place. When he heard Jesus had come out of Judea into Galilee, he goes to him and he says, "My, my son's at the point of death. Jesus therefore said to him, unless... You people. Now, notice that he says, you people. There are a host of other people around. Now, I think that Jesus is using this nobleman as an example of what true faith is. But he's he's speaking to these other people, and he says, unless you people see signs and wonders, you will simply will not believe. Because what does Jesus know? Jesus knows that this nobleman is going to take that step of faith without ever seeing a sign and wonder. Based on what? Based on the Word. Here's where we want to be in our modern Christian society. This is what we've been taught faith is. That we go, we see signs and wonders, and then we believe. Then we have faith enough to take a baby step. And what does God's Word say? Oh, we don't like this. God's Word says, based on my Word, take that step of faith and then watch me do what I said I would do based on my Word, not on what you think or what you feel or what somebody else told you. What what did God say? You simply won't believe unless you see signs and wonders. People are are very subjective according to the Bible in terms of their faith. And I I want you to see this morning that this, this process of genuine faith is not a subjective thing. It's not a subjective thing. This process of a genuine faith is, is exactly as I've described it. God speaks, I turn, I take a step of faith, and I trust in Him. How many of you believe that chair will hold me if I sit down in it? How many of you believe that? You know why you believe that? Because you're you're sitting on one, and it's holding you, and some of you are bigger than I am. And and, and you've got to, what is that faith in? The faith is in that chair. The faith is in the chair will hold me up. So that if I come up here and you say, the chair will hold you up, and I come up here and I go, and you go, wow, it held him up. I, my faith in the chair is confirmed. Now, you might think, well, that's a silly example, but we, we know a guy that was translating the Bible in one of the South American countries. And he was, he was trying to talk about what belief is, what faith is. And there was no word in the language for that kind of faith that you would just Trust that that's there. And so one day he's standing there and he's, he's translated almost all of the book of John. And he, he, can't get, he, he can't get this. What is this? How can I describe faith in this language? Because they, no, they had no experiential word for faith. No word for trust or belief. So this native comes in and they're in a little uh, Hogan kind of building. And the native comes in and there was a hammock there and the native throws himself into the hammock and falls into the hammock. And the guy said, wait, wait, what did you just do? And the guy gave him the word for throwing your weight on something. 
He says that's faith. That's what trust, belief, faith is. It's trusting. And when we throw our weight on the word of the Lord Jesus Christ, we're trusting in his works, the person and works of Jesus Christ. We're trusting in his word being true. So that when we, when we do that, we're taking that step of faith. And then it either holds us or it doesn't. Anybody got this? So here's, here's the reality. We, we look at this and we say, well, I don't want a subjective faith. I want an objective faith. Well, here's the truth. Faith, faith is not mysterious in the sense of what it is. God's word, my step of faith, his confirmation in my life. Now, but how many of you, like me, have looked at a situation, heard God's word, said, boy, that looks hard. I don't think I'm going to go that route. See, and we, we fail to have faith. Now, I didn't have, I, 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 when I've used this as an example, that's just faith in a chair. But if, but if I have faith in the person and work of Christ, it's a totally different thing we see what we want to see sometimes we go to these things and and we 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 can be fooled you know magicians can fool us they can they can make things look like that they're magical and we look at them we go wow did you see that we know intellectually that what we saw isn't true when i saw a guy take an elephant and put it on a podium with people totally surrounding it, raise a curtain, immediately drop it, and the elephant's gone, I know in my mind he didn't make it disappear. I know it for a fact. So there's a sense in which we can always kind of explain away something. Now sometimes, let me just say, I want to show both sides of this this morning, sometimes we need to have revealed to us the truth about what I'm calling the shysters those that present a fake faith and will tell you the reason you're not healed is because you didn't believe enough. I don't see that anywhere in the Bible. Nowhere. So here we go. We see what we want to see. It's a subjective faith. Our heart attitude often dictates what we see uh, more than our eyes do. We want to believe certain things. We want things to be true. This lady that followed this guy around, she wanted him to heal her. But she had her faith totally broken when he looked at her one night and said, you've followed me all over this country, and the reason you're not healed is you don't have enough faith. She was broken, destroyed, had her faith totally destroyed because she thought what her faith was was tied to her being healed not in the person and word of Jesus Christ. Am I making any sense to anybody? Okay, so miracles can be denied. Now, let me, let me just say this. Hear what I'm about to tell you. I absolutely, 100% believe God still does miracles today. But they are not for spectacle. Okay? Jesus looks at these people all around and says, unless you see signs and wonders, you won't even believe. This guy's going to respond based on my word. Watch. He says, turn and go home. Your son's healed. And he turns and goes home. That's faith. That's the first step of faith. That's a, really the second step of faith. He, he hears the word. He believes it enough to take that step of faith. And he goes and gets it confirmed. So these acts, these miracles, they can supplement our faith. But the miracle itself should not be the reason for our faith. Can I say that again? They will supplement our faith. They will encourage us. They will strengthen us. But they should not be the reason for our faith. Unless you see signs and wonders, you're not going to believe. Jesus is fussing at these guys. He says, believe in me. Here I am. He says, I'm going to give you one sign. What did he say? I'll give you one sign. The third day, the temple will be destroyed, and the third day I will raise it up again. Raise it up again in three days. And what was he talking about? He said he was talking about his body. 
So our, our, our problem here is that we, we, we tend to get caught in a cycle that, we, that if our faith is in an act or a sign and wonder, we've got to go back and get juiced up again. We've got to come back and, and believe something again. We've got to come back and, and get a p- taste of that again. And Jesus says, I don't want you to have that kind of faith. I want you to have the kind of faith that says, if I, ra- if I was raised from the dead and died on the cross for your sins, atoned for your sins, and was raised from the dead, giving you newness of life, I'm, I, I want you to believe. Have faith. Trust. Throw your weight on. People who depend on miracles to believe are in constant danger of losing their faith. And let, let me tell you something. Let, let me give you a warning. Here's a big red flag warning. The enemy will use that fact against you if you're trusting only in a miracle happening in your life every week. Listen, a miracle by definition it is, is, the, is something that's not the norm of God. By definition, it is not the normative way of God. God comes in and does a miracle, and sometimes he does, and he confirms in me that, the, that, that, that what I've trusted in him for, what his word was telling me, what I was encouraged to do, I did on faith, and he's, he's given me a confirmation of that. And like I say, I see those occasionally, and I'm thankful for them. So if our, if our faith depends on miracles, we've got a faith, little f faith. They're false miracles. Let's watch this video. Turn it up for me, Farron, if you would. Watch this video, and you'll see what I'm talking about. It's up to you. The Word said you can have what you say and what you think. As a man thinker, so is he. Hallelujah! W.V. Grant is an old-fashioned, second-generation singing revival preacher. He's a healing Jesus. Grant is a faith healer who appears on TV all across the country. And his followers travel miles to see him and give a lot of money because they believe in his miracle. Grant says it's God who tells him the names to call out of the audience and what illnesses have to be healed. Pauline, God said as long as you live, you'll never have to see a speech therapist again. God. We discovered that before every service, Grant and his associates circulate informally among the friends and family of the sick, making notes, or even casually interviewing the people who will later be healed. We saw Grant gather information on more than 35 people he later seemed to identify by revelation from God. But if pre-interviews explain the revelations, what explains the healing? We observe that Grant uses a series of artful deceptions and tricks. For example, we saw Grant walk up to this man during the service and hold up his cane. Here's a man that's all crippled up too. He healed him and told him to run down the aisle. The crowd thunders applause. But let's look at that again. Grant isn't grabbing the cane of the man. He's grabbing the cane of the woman in the next seat. Outside, the man told us his problem was with his arm. He had never had any trouble walking. And when we questioned the people Grant had lifted out of wheelchairs, everyone we talked to said they could walk all along. Could you walk at all before you can? So we wondered, why don't they speak up? These two people worked for Grant, knew him very well, and say he knows that religious people want to preserve the illusion and won't give him away. And there's something else we want to show you. Here's what happened when Grant called up this woman. Her name is Diane Doherty. Grant hadn't talked to her, but before the service, he had talked to this woman, her friend, Kelly Sutherland. He didn't know that both of these women work for prime time. Has she been sick? She slipped a disc last okay. year and, and uh, has been in pain ever since. Would she lift something or fall? She was lifting a suitcase. But when Grant called Diane up, it seemed the information had just come into his head. This disc is not in line with the rest of them. In fact, what Diane doesn't have back pain. She said this because we'd noticed in every service Grant amazed the crowd when he detected that someone with back pain had one leg shorter than the other. 
sure enough, he decided Diane had the problem too. The leg on this side, because of the slit disc, is a little bit shorter than the leg on that side. Everyone you're about to see an old magician's trick. As Diane sits down, Grant grabs her shoe, pulls out the heel of the shoe to make the leg look longer. As he prays, he slowly pushes the heel of the shoe back in, giving the illusion that the short leg has grown. There it is, in the name of Jesus, hallelujah! And every miracle means money for Grant. We watched thousands of people, people with cancer, leukemia, elderly on fixed incomes, line up to give money. Sources say the ministry takes in six to ten million dollars a year, much of which Grant takes out for himself. I knew of one instance where there was a Mercedes bought in Fort Lauderdale, Florida for $84,000. Did he pay in cash? Cash. Cash money. And here is the million dollar mansion where the Grants now live, just one of several properties his ministry owns. And even as Grant was sending out this fundraising letter one Christmas, begging followers for money, saying he had to borrow $99. According to documents obtained by Primetime, he was buying his second Ferrari, a 1990 model that lists at $105,000. Faith healing isn't the only way Grant gets followers to give money. For decades, he's touched their hearts with his televised appeals for food and clothes for the orphans of Haiti. In Grant's services, associate pastor Ross Collette tells how Grant supports 3,500 children, 64 orphanages in Haiti. Uh, Brother Grant has 64 or more orphanages in Haiti. The orphanage still exists, full of children who do need money, food, and clothes. But how much does Grant give? Two of the doctors who now run the orphanage told us Grant doesn't give them a dime. No, you never receive any money. No. So you get no money from no. Reverend Grant? He doesn't come here? No. He does nothing for your children? No. no. But you're really saying Reverend Grant is a fraud. Do we? We? Yes. He's a healing Jesus. Why, why do I show you this? I, I want, anytime something like this is done, it darkens and blackens the name of Jesus Christ. Because as soon as somebody exposes something like this, then people say, well, that's what Christians are. That's the way all Christianity is. That's what faith is all about. It is not about that. It has, listen, it has come to be about that in America and throughout the world. Uh, you know, when we go to Africa, who are they looking for? They're looking for Benny Hinn to show up. They're looking for this guy to show up. Why? Because they're, they're, they're seeking the signs and wonders Jesus spoke about. So I, I don't want you to be disillusioned when you see this kind of thing because there are frauds out there. There are shysters out there that will use even the name of Jesus to try to, to, try to, to game the system, to try to do something that, that is evil in the sight of the Lord. So, but just because there are those people doesn't mean God doesn't still do miracles. It doesn't mean God is not hearing you. It doesn't mean there isn't a genuine faith that you can count on. And I want you to hear me today. That faith where you hear the word, you respond by a step of faith, and you have confirmation is a, is a, a, a par process that's going on over and over and over again throughout all of history, and it still is happening today. That's what faith is. Is trusting in his word. Miracles. Matthew 16, 4 says this. An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and a sign will not be given it except the sign of Jonah. And he left them, and he went away. What was the sign of Jonah? Tear down this temple, and I'll raise it up again in three days. The sign of Jonah being in the belly of the whale for three days, and then coming out of the belly of the whale. He says, that's... That's the sign you will get. And that's, that's the only sign I'm going to give you. So when you see that, when you see Jesus go into the grave and then come out of the grave three days later and go back into heaven sitting at the right hand of God as your intercessor, you can trust that that Jesus with that same power of resurrection is still working in our lives today. And I want you to understand that's true. In spite of all the, the garbage that goes on, that's to take away from the very person and work of Jesus Christ. So to believe, to have faith, is what 
it isn't just what I choose to believe, although that's, that's what this a generation has come to believe. If I believe it, and I'm sincere in my belief, it doesn't make any difference if it's true or not. If I'm sincere in my belief that that's enough, that that's good faith, and that's simply not true. That we believe the truth and not have, and not have the truth dictated by what I believe. Do you, you see what I'm saying? Uh, to feel something is true for me. We, we had a lady visited this church for a while. Elvis spent a lot of time with her. Some of the rest of you have as well. She doesn't come here anymore. Do you know why she doesn't come here anymore? Because she, she, she told Elva, I don't go there anymore because, uh, because her, uh, this pastor insists on there being an absolute truth and that Jesus is that truth as far as salvation is concerned that there had to be a way that everybody was going to go to heaven no matter what path that they walked, and that there, this idea of Jesus being the exclusive way to heaven was just too much. Well, I'm going to speak the truth anyway. That's what the Bible says. John 14, 6, Jesus makes it clear, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and nobody comes to the Father except by me. And I'm going to preach it till the day I die. And there will be some that will walk away because that's just not tolerant. Listen, intolerance is not speaking the truth and allowing somebody to go to hell for not speaking the truth. It's not just, belief is not just mental assent. I can come back here and I can go, I believe that chair will hold me. I believe it. I believe it intellectually. But until I put my, throw myself into that chair... I have it believed in the way that the Bible talks about faith. Faith is following, it's doing what God says do. James says, I'll make me not just a hearer of the word, but a doer of the word. The, the personal trust in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Verse 49, the royal official said to him, Sir, come down before my child dies. Jesus said to him, Go your way, your son lives. The man believed, took a step of faith. What did he believe? The word that Jesus spoke. And he started off. He started off. Romans 10, 17 says, So faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of Christ. The power of the word of God can produce faith in what is true. Now what this guy said, Grant said, is not true. You can't speak your own future. You cannot. That is not biblical. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. That's true. But it's not, it doesn't mean that you just have get anything you want that your flesh wants. Because that's not, eat, listen, that's not good for you. Jesus wants what's good for you. Believe the word that Jesus spoke and he started off. So here's the cycle. He says, go your way. Jesus speaks the word, go your way, and he starts off. That's the cycle. He calls for a step of faith, an action that turns uh, our biases into action based on what Jesus said, not on our biases. Uh, it's an objective marker. It's not, it's not subjective in any way. And as he was now going down, his slaves met him and sang to him, the son was living. So he inquired of them the hour when he began to get better. And he, they said to him, uh, yesterday at the seventh hour, this fever left him. The sense there is at the seventh hour, it left him immediately. It left him immediately. Now notice what didn't happen here. The man didn't go and say, now servants, I bet that happened at the seventh hour, didn't it? No. He says, when did it happen? They said the seventh hour. And he's thinking back, that's exactly when Jesus told me to go. My son was healed. He is well. So the father knew that it was about that hour in which Jesus said to him, your son lives. And he, he himself believed. The whole household believed with him. So here's belief confirmed. He heard the word of Jesus. He takes a step of faith. 
Here's his belief confirmed. He gets it confirmed by his very own household. This experience confirms that Jesus' words were true. And listen, it makes a difference whether it's actually true or not. It makes a difference. It makes a difference whether these people were really crippled and got up and ran down the aisle. They couldn't walk before and they did then. Or they, they could walk all along. It makes a difference. Not just that I want to believe it, but that I, listen, here, here's, I'm just going to give you a bias right out of the block here, okay? Some of you won't like me for this, but I'm going to say it anyway. If these people are genuinely healing in Jesus' name, here's what I think they need to do. Quit holding revival meetings. Go to hospitals and walk from room to room to room to room to room and lay your hands on everybody and heal them. Spend your time productively. People will support you. Okay? Just my personal bias there. What if the son had been dead? Okay. But what if this son had been dead? Jesus told him to go. His son was healed. Did it make a difference? Yeah, it, it, it makes a difference in whether it, what Jesus told him was true or not. It makes a difference in whether Jesus... If Jesus tells me something's true and it's proven false, I need to find out why. Did I misunderstand or was it wrong? He told this man it was true. To, his son was healed. Go and trust me. So it would make a difference. Yeah. Experience follows acting in faith. The experience of that chair catching me followed my activity of trusting it and falling into it. Then it was confirmed. Mark 9, 24. I do believe, Lord, but please help me overcome my unbelief. Okay, I believe enough to start out. But do I believe enough to throw my weight in the chair? What what if every one of you came in here and every one of you sat down in the chairs, and every one of the chairs collapsed. And then I ask you, do you believe that chair would hold me? You go, no, pastor, don't sit in that chair. If I'd go then and sit in it, and it wouldn't hold me, what you told me would be confirmed. And what Jesus told this man was confirmed. He says, and he gets there, and he says, help me to trust you enough to believe when I get there, and it's true. Because I could explain it away. Well, the son just happened to get well. He just happened to get well at that very hour. Do do you see that our trust and our faith shouldn't, our faith should not be rooted in some miracle taking place, but we should certainly acknowledge it when it does. That God acted and God moved. He himself believed in his whole household. The Lord saved his entire household as a result. A testimony obviously went out. This is again the second sign that Jesus performed and he had, uh, had come out of Judea into Galilee. So let's look quickly at the, what's taking place here. A person is seeking the truth in Jesus Christ. A person comes seeking. We go out to the, to the guys that, that are prisoners out there. They don't have to be there. We've already had some come and don't come back anymore because the guys there gave them a hard time. So they, they bent over to the guys saying, I'll I'll just let you talk me out of this. So you won't give me a hard time anymore. But we got those that continue to come back again and again and again and again. They are the ones that are seeking, the ones that are seeking the person of Jesus. Jesus speaks the word. The guy is willing to act on that word. God confirms that it's true. And the man acquires real, genuine faith. Now his faith is not rooted and, and based and determined by the miracle. But the miracle is, is reviving in him and confirming in him, just like my going out there and being revived by these guys that I go talk to. Let's stand and sing. The faith has found a resting place. My faith has found a resting place.